are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I can't keep playing. I'm so glad to hear your voice. <laughs> Likewise, it's been so long. <laughs> it's I like, know. I feel like we only talk through memes. <laughs> like exactly. Instagram. Aw, I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> so I have some interview questions for you. <laughs> okay. You want to get started? Yeah. Okay. So, of course, you're Boricua, from, meaning you're a Puerto Rican. Yeah. That's what it means, right? You're Boric- Boricua means like um, three cultures in Puerto Rico. Is that right? The meaning? Um, Boric- Boricua comes from um, Puerto Rico's original Taino name, which was Boriquen. Um, and then the, bo- the word Borica came from Boriquen, which was, you know, the natives from the island. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, growing up in Puerto Rico, did your classmates have any idea that you were a supermodel in the making? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I know it's so cliche when people say, oh, you know, I was the ugly girl in school. Nobody liked me, blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying that I consider myself ugly, nor did other people, but I wasn't what was considered attractive to them because culturally I just didn't fit in of what the beauty aesthetic was for, you know, a Latin person. You know, I was just too thin, too tall, and too dark. So I just didn't fit in. I, you know, they knew I had a beautiful face, but it wasn't like guys were checking for me or anything. Oh, wow. So no, I I don't think they, they knew what a model was. The only concept that they had of beauty was pageants, like Miss Universe, um, because Puerto Rico would always win and people would make a big deal about it. But as far as, you know, fashion modeling, no. Wow. Did you have any idea that that you were destined for greatness at such a young age? Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I think I just went into everything with an open mind. Um, and not knowing what it was, I just remember seeing, because where I grew up is very country. So it's not like we had like cable television. So we had to have like these huge satellites, the ones that go on top of the the roof and they would rotate and we would have like other channels. So that's why I spoke English really well because my dad is from St. Thomas and then watching TV. And then I would watch two Hollywood stories of, you know, 90 supermodels or of, Claudia Schiffer or this that and the other or I would watch fashion tv and I just remember looking at these girls and I was like wow they resemble me they're skinny you know they're skinny and they're tall and you know there's an opportunity for someone that looks like me so I think that's where my like light bulb kind of like went on and I I saw myself there wow like I I I knew I could fit in yeah it was like home <laughs> uh-huh. I just didn't know the extent, but I was like, I was game. <laughs> well, if you could travel back in time and give fifteen year old Joan any advice, what would it be? Fifteen year old Joan. Don't doubt yourself as much. So um I feel like a lot of the times our own doubts can seep in and can um, hinder our own growth. And that's what I would tell her to listen to her intuition more and focus on that rather than the exterior world to just like hone in and focus on that. Beautiful. Were there any other careers that little Joan dreamed of while growing up? Hell yeah, I wanted to be a veterinarian. <laughs> wow. Because I grew up with animals. Um, like you name it, I had it from peacocks, chickens, pheasants, pigs, cats, dogs, cows, turkeys, like everything except the horse. And <laughs> I was always just so in tune with animals and I would always want to take care of them and you know nurture them back to health if they were sick I would raise you know little chickens and I was just like oh I want to take care of something that can't that that doesn't have a voice and can't take care of itself and then I learned that you know you have to like euthanize animals and stuff like that and I'm too emotional 
So I knew I couldn't be dealing with that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't think this is for me. Because every time an animal would die, I would cry. And I would do like a little burial. So it just Aww. became a thing. <laughs> and I was like, uh, maybe uh, this is not it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Aw, you could have started your own like animal funeral service. Yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> it would have been great in the United States. <laughs> And then I thought I was going to be um, a therapist. Um, so I went to school to study uh, psychology because my mom is, or she's a retired social worker. And basically, I just love how she always, you know, helped other people. You know, like that was her main goal to make sure that people were safe and loved and taken care of. And she took out of her time to like diligently do it compared to other social workers. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to do something that was like a step above a social work. And I was like, oh, maybe um, therapy would be in psychology. And my eldest sister was studying it as well. So I was like, oh, okay, let me, let me give this a try. And I think just with my personality, I was always interested in individuals and people's stories. And um, um, I'm an empath which is probably why the whole animal thing too happened. But once I was there and I had great grades and I graduated in like two years and a half or two years and I graduated Magna Cum Laude, which is, you know, super high honors. Um, I just, it wasn't my passion. Yeah, I just was like about you. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, no, you know, I knew you, I've known you for a long time now and I could tell that you are well educated because you're like you're well spoken and I can tell that you you're just like a smart person that really has her head on her shoulders obviously but I didn't know that you graduated at high honors <laughs> yeah 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 because um the thing was I I wanted to model in the state and I just remember like my dad always pressuring me because he was thin and he'd be like you know you better get your sheepskin, sheepskin which is to get you know a degree in college because he you know those, those old school they're adamant about getting your education because that's all that we have and he would always say Joan you know God forbid you don't want something to happen to you you get into an accident and your beauty's taken away then what uh -huh. he's like have something in your brain nobody can take that from you and then if you're going to be in a business where you're going to be dealing with money and other adults don't let them be you know, potentially smarter than you because you don't know how to read a contract or you don't know how to carry yourself or you don't know how to communicate. He's like, you know, have more on your side. So I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. And I found a program that you could do a bachelor's in two years. And I was like, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Check so it out the list real quick. Yeah. And then I was like, here, here's the diploma here. And, um, <laughs> and then he like sent me off with his blessing. So he could have saying anything he was just like well at least you know you have this to fall, fall, fall back on um so I did that and what yeah, did and you ever present that at, at first that he wasn't letting you go right away um no because funny enough he's always been supportive because when I would do um like modeling competitions in Puerto Rico when I was 13 or 14 he was really supportive I mean I was still in school so it was like an extracurricular activity Mm -hmm. Um, but he was really supportive. He just always believed that models were like prostitutes. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you know, they sell their bodies or like they're around rich men and you know, when I'm in it, then literally I find out some people actually do. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so that was funny. So I just think he didn't have a, a the real concept of modeling and that you could make a living off of it you know it's just the unknown and then I think once he saw that I could make a career out of it and that I was like making money he's like oh okay like this is actually a real thing so tell me about these modeling com competitions and you said it was only in Puerto Rico yeah I don't know if you remember like elite models or Ford models mm -hmm. yeah that they, they used to do it like in each state mm -hmm. and then um, well, yeah, each state and then somebody would represent like United States, Puerto Rico, Russia, you know, France, uh, England. It was almost like a pageant 
but for mm-hmm. modeling. And then the girl that would win would win a contract with that agency for like 250000 back then. And I was like, oh, my God, that's so much money. I can help my parents, you know. And I'm like 14 years old. So that's like a lot. I mean, today is that shit is a lot of money. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, my God, that would be so amazing. And then, funny enough, I, I lost. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'll never forget my mom's face after the competition. I remember the night before, because we stayed like in a hotel in Puerto Rico. Um, and I remember crying and yeah. holding holding back my tears so she wouldn't hear it on the phone so that I could, you know, portray myself as being strong. Like I was like, I don't want her to know that I'm like actually nervous, but I was actually crying. And they're like wishing me luck and like to kick ass and this, that, and the other, and you know, giving me my pep talk. And then at the end, I think I was like maybe a runner up Mm -hmm. and I lost. And then, you know, they come to greet me backstage. And I remember seeing my mom's face, and that shit broke my heart more than the competition. It was like she wanted it for me so bad. It wasn't like a, a face of disappointment. It was like she was heartbroken that her baby didn't win. Uh-huh. You know, like she knew that I wanted it. And it was just that face of like, I wish I could help her, but I can't. And that shit till this day haunts me. And maybe that's why sometimes I do things and I'm like, nah, this is <laughs> this is bigger than me. You know, like it's a representation of, you know, my family and where I come from. So maybe that's why I, I do things differently. Oh. Yeah, you definitely, you're authentic. I love that about you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have another question about Puerto Rico. I'm curious, mm-hmm. back then growing up, was there a beauty product that was like um, like a staple to Puerto Ricans? Hmm. It doesn't have to be a specific brand. It could even just be like no, no, I know. gel or something like that. <laughs> um, I would say most... I would say mostly it would be hair things because of the humidity. Mm-hmm. Um, so like hardening gel was a thing, uh-huh. you know, so like when you scraped your hair back in a ponytail or when you did a side swoop, you had gel or hairspray um, to hold it tight because, you know, poof up by 3 p.m. by the end. Yeah. So I think I think it was more more hair products than beauty. Sure, because it's that island humid, humidity type of lifestyle. Yeah, and then also to another thing, girls were always into nails, into like acrylic nails mm-hmm. at a young age. Mm-hmm. Like in seventh, eighth grade, girls would always have a new set with a design. I never did because my parents, you know, they didn't mm-hmm. have money to spend in that and just they didn't see it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say those two things. So the nails were a big thing. I remember growing up too here in the States, um, getting acrylics a lot as like a teenager as well. Did you get? Yeah, I used to get acrylics for Mm -hmm. sure. (laughs) Do you notice the young girls there, like teenagers still doing, like being very expressive with art, uh, nail art and stuff like that nowadays? I wouldn't wouldn't know because I haven't, I've been a little bit out of, touch with it since my mom retired um so I'm not like seeing it but I'm sure it's still there I I can't imagine it not how about growing up in Puerto Rico was there a hairstyle that was very popular then like didn't I know growing up for me in the states a lot of the Puerto Rican girls that I would go to school with used to do um the kiss curls like those little like waves that are like you know sculpted on the hairline (laughs) you know was that a thing in Puerto Rico or was there other hairstylists that were really popular growing up popular was always a blowout oh okay Mm -hmm. like like a bouncy nice blowout um half half up half down hairstyle Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah um you know Oh, the little curls coming out the front of the hair, you know, like a little, (laughs) yeah, like a little antenna, but like in a curly pot, but like curled. And it's like one or you do two and then you'll do a, like a ponytail or, or half up, half down. Yeah. Um, Like very nineties, right? Exactly. Exactly. It was always nineties, you know, the Aaliyah hairstyle, like stuff like that. I love that. 
That's cool. And was there any sort of like beauty products that I know you mentioned, like even nowadays that you feel like Puerto Ricans love? Like, is there like um even like a brand of that people that you feel like everyone has? You know how like editorial hairdressers, most of them have like the Elnet L'Oreal hairspray. Like, is there like some expected vanity product that you can think of that like, like even nowadays are like a part of Puerto Rican culture? I feel like it, it was like more pharmacy, pharmacy beauty brand. Mm-hmm. And maybe back then it was like, I feel like L'Oreal was fancy. Okay. It would probably be like a, it would be like a V O five or like, um, what's the other one that they do like a body wash? Was it essence or essentials? Herbal essences? Herbal, yes, herbal, herbal essence. Yeah. It was like, it was, it was like beauty products like that. I remember one time smelling someone's hair randomly and saying, do you use herbal essence? And they said, how'd you know? And I I was like, I felt like I just like slam dunked. You traveled. (laughs) It's it's almost like traveling in time. It like hits you. You're like, oh, wow. I remember this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so going back into your modeling career, so you would say that it basically started with these uh, modeling competitions. Yeah, Uh, for sure. And then can you walk me through, like, there was this moment where you considered starting modeling or signing with an agency or moving, and but then you got on track to go to school. What was in between there, like – were you scouted or oh no so basically um when I did one of the competitions I then got represented by an agency in Puerto Rico so then I would be sent to castings or I'd get like bookings for like some fashion shows or like Mm -hmm. photo shoots or editorials but it's Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico when you say you're a model is more out of um like a title but Mm -hmm. not a career because the the money that you make in Puerto Rico is not comparable to the living. So you would do a show and it'd be like two hundred, four hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can't live off of that because it's not like that there's that many shows. Mm-hmm. Um so it's more out of the experience or just to say that you're doing this thing. Um so therefore I was kinda like, eh, this is not it. Like I want it to be more and just watching the shows. So um one of the agents that was in the competition was an American agent and he liked me and he was like Jonah actually wanted you to win but they said you were too thin and I was like oh well god damn <laughs> what and then I was like isn't it y'all want the skinny girls but I guess I was too thin because I was like 14 years old and <laughs> you know I was <laughs> still growing and we remained in loose contact and um while I was in college There was like another, what's they call these, where you go to Florida and all the agencies from all, from United States goes. Mm -hmm. And then you go from like, it's like in a big room. And then you pay like, I think it was like $2,000 and everybody sees you. And my, like a scouting event of some sort? Yeah, basically. basically. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking the mall and somebody once had stopped me. And they're like, oh, have you considered doing this universe? And, you know, there's, I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know if it's for me, blah, blah, blah. Especially knowing that, especially back then, Puerto Rico was very close-minded when it came to the aesthetic of beauty, especially with my skin color. Um, there wasn't many, you know, dark women winning the pageant. So I was like, oh, this is going to be a waste of money. And, you know, because you have to fund it yourself. And I remember telling my dad and he's like, um, well, Joan, if you want to, like, you know, I'll, again, he was super supportive, you know, we'll do it, we'll figure it out. And then I remember contemplating and saying, yeah, I don't think this is the route for me because what they're going to end up doing is giving me fake tits, doing my nose and trying to mold me into a different person to win the pageant. I'm not going to end up looking like myself and I'm not going to be able to model after this. And I was like, that career is going to be too short lived. And I didn't want that as my ultimate goal. So I was like, yeah, it's not it. 
And then um, there was this other thing. And I told my dad, and he's like, Joe, you know, if you want, um, let's, you know, I'll give you the money and you could go to Florida. And I forgot why. I don't know how I came with the, I came up with the idea, but I remember the agencies in New York have an open call casting, which means like Monday would be elite, Tuesday would be Ford, Maryland, and they would have it for like two hours, certain days. So I told him, I was like, you know, why don't you give me the money and I'll go with my sister to New York and I'll hit up all the agencies. And he's like, okay, Joan, then give me your plan. I want to see it because he wanted to know if I was actually serious. So I went online on the internet. I did my own schedules of what day I was going to hit what agency, what was their direction, the, you know, like the address. And I showed it to him. He's like, okay, Joan, so you'll do it. Let's go. So I went, came with my sister. Agency, again, turned, turned my ass down. And then I went to IMG and they like sent girls and it was just me and one girl. And I look at my sister and I was like, oh my God, I think, I think they're going to see me through the doors because you just send your portfolio and they come back with my book. And I was like, God damn it. Fucking hell. (laughs) 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 And then I was like, oh damn. And then I went to one agency, which was women. And it was the same agent that had met me at one of the competitions that I did in Puerto Rico. And he's like, Joan, you know, we're super, we're interested, but you have to straighten your teeth out. Because I had one side that was really crooked. And I was like, but why? Like, I know so many, like, white girls who have crooked teeth. And, like, that doesn't stop him. And he's Hawaiian. His name is Roman Young. And to this day, I, like, always respect him for his sincerity and transparency and he said Joan you're already black don't give him another reason not to book you Hmm. and I was like you know some people could have take that and be like oh my god that is so bad but it's constructive criticism like he wanted wanted me to win so I was like you know what so during that time is when I would went to college and in the two years that I was in college I was straightening my teeth Mm-hmm. And then I came back and remained in loose contact. He moved to Elite Models, and he signed me straight away. Hmm. And that's how I started. Mm-hmm. That's the same guy that signed you that said to get the braces? Yeah, exactly. I see. So sometimes all it takes is just one person to have a vision oh, and, yeah. you know, helps you through, see you through it. Wow. That's so interesting. I didn't know this. That's really cool. Like just to learn about the first steps, you know? So you moved Mm -hmm. to New York then? Yeah. Yeah. I moved to New York to Queens actually with my aunt and um, she had a two bedroom with my cousin and I ended up sleeping on an air mattress in her room while she was going to college. So I stayed there maybe for like a year and a half maybe and then I found my own place and stayed in Queens for a little bit and that's so the struggle was real <laughs> oh, it really was did you ever live with like in a model apartment situation oh no hell no uh, no <laughs> I can't no it's too many people crammed up too many personalities yeah. um, and I just wanted to be especially not knowing the place New York, I wanted to feel like in a safe environment with people who I knew, you mm-hmm. know? And yeah, and you were young. How old were you around that time? Maybe like 19, 19 and a half. So mm-hmm. I started late, was considered late in modeling. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Well, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So did you ever live in any other of the fashion capitals or like LA or you were always in New York since then? Um, I tried Paris for a little bit because um, I wanted to break in through high fashion and, you know, no agency in New York in Paris wanted to sign me. Mm -hmm. So when I finally got a small agency to sign me, um, I was like, oh, maybe I'll just live here for a month. I didn't last maybe like two weeks and a half or three weeks because jobs kept on booking me in New York. So I was like, and I wasn't getting anything in Paris. And especially back then, 
there wasn't many spaces for girls that looked like me. So it was hard to break through. And I was like, I'm going to take math back home where I could actually make some money, you know, like I gave it a chance. And then I just continued working with doing a lot of commercial work with um, brands like, you know, Neiman Marcus, Saks Fifth Avenue, Nordstrom, J. Crew, Macy's, like all those high commercial catalogs. I would always just book them. Yeah, so you you went where the demand was. (laughs) Smart. Yeah, I became like a catalog queen.